Throughout the colonial era of the United States, it was interesting to note that whenever the British government issued a policy, the colonial response was always complex and varied, with discontent one after another. However, the reason behind these grievances was quite simple. The colonists had to owe allegiance to the British, but behind this loyalty, they seemed to receive very little benefit. Apart from nominal protection, in reality the colonial people saw no tangible return. Despite this, the British government would have promised to protect the colonists from the Aborigines, but in fact, the relationship between the colonists and the Aborigines was not bad during this period. Because in the event of a conflict, it must be the responsibility of the colonizers in general. Despite this, there were constant conflicts between indigenous tribes, which led to the unprovoked involvement of the colonists. In the 1630s, there was a Pico War, which was supposed to be a conflict between indigenous tribes. The war began with a dispute between the Picos and the Mohicans in the Connecticut River region, who competed for valuable coastline resources. However, the situation changed suddenly, and although the shells and beads there were valuable commodity exchanges for them, like early currency, the British and Dutch did not anticipate that they would be drawn into the conflict. After the Picos won the war, they began to suspect that these colonists were not as powerful as they thought. This mindset led them to rob Captain John Stone and his companions and kill them. But there is another rumor that John Stone had kidnapped an Indian girl and attempted to assault the daughter of the chief of the Picos, which is the real reason for the Picos' revenge. Two years later, another incident exacerbated the conflict, when New England merchant John Ohio was murdered and his belongings looted. But in reality the incident was the work of a Sinantics, who were allies of the Picos. The British saw these acts as provocations and retaliated by sending an army led by John Endicott. Endicott led his soldiers and Indian allies to Block Island, where he burned down Sinantic villages and killed some of its inhabitants. Then they turned to the coastal village of Pico and repeated the same atrocities. In this way, Endicott's absence angered the Picos and provoked a retaliatory attack on the British colony. A series of skirmishes and negotiations followed, but none of them made substantial progress. Finally, on May 26, 1637, English troops and Indian allies launched a decisive assault on the Picos fortress near the Mystic River. The attack was brutal and a large number of Picos were killed in the fire, most of them women and children. Only a few escaped, but they were hunted down or captured. This massacre essentially marked the end of the Pico War, and the Picos lost most of their population and territory. Their leader, Sassacus, fled west with the survivors, hoping to be helped by the Dutch or the Iroquois League. But unfortunately, they encountered the Mohawks, the most powerful tribe in the Iroquois alliance. The Mohawks did not like the Picos, and they captured Sassacus and cut off his head and hands and gave them to the British, which marked the complete demise of the Picos. Further south in the Hudson Valley and Virginia, there were tensions within the Indians and conflicts between them and the colonists. However, there was an Indian named Opascanet, who was a chieftain who belonged to the League of Powhatan, and was not only the younger brother of Powhatan, the founder of the League, but also the uncle of the famous Indian princess Pocahontas, who later married the British colonists. Although his name was thought to possibly mean his soul was white, symbolizing that he was very intelligent and cunning, he was full of resentment about the arrival of the British. He believed that the colonizers not only occupied their land, but also deprived them of resources, spread disease, and tried to change their beliefs and way of life. Despite this, Okesh Kanat maintained a certain diplomatic skill, but after running out of patience, he decided to take action, launching two large-scale sneak attacks in an attempt to drive away or eliminate the British. The first sneak attack took place on March 22, 1622, the day of the 1622 Indian Massacre. Opash Kanat had arranged in advance some Indians to pretend to be at peace with the British and even to trade and socialize. On a calm morning, however, the Indians launched a surprise attack, killing 347 colonists in plantations and communities along the James River, almost one-third of the colony's English-speaking population at the time. The massacre, while shocking the British, also prompted them to begin to take more drastic and violent measures against the Indians. They began burning villages, destroying crops, and killing or capturing Indians. As a result, the two cultures are in a decade-long state of war, with each conflict deepening the hatred between the two sides. 
The second sneak attack took place in June 1644. At this time, Opesh Kennot was already an old man in his 90s. Despite his advanced age, his hatred and will to resist the British did not wane. Seizing the fact that the British were busy fighting the Dutch in the Civil War, he planned another raid. On June 18th, he led about 500 Indian warriors against as many as 350 colonists on the south bank of the James River. Although the massacre did not cause as great losses as before, it still caused panic and anger among the British. However, the British quickly organized a counterattack. The British quickly organized a counterattack, and an army led by Richard Bennett and William Claiborne began to pursue Opesh Kennet. By October, they had found Opesh Kennet's hiding place and surrounded it. Despite his serious illness, Opus Gainer refused to surrender, declaring, if you want my land, you must step over my corpse. However, just then, a British soldier took the opportunity to shoot Opesh Kennet in the back, knocking him out. Eventually, Opesh Kennet was captured and taken to Jamestown, where he was imprisoned as a prisoner of war. In the same year, serious conflicts also broke out on the territory of the Dutch on the Hudson River. The Dutch slaughtered 120 Algonquins near New Amsterdam who had just escaped the clutches of the Mohawks, in retaliation for several earlier murders. However, different Algonquin tribes, united for revenge, attacked the Dutch colony. But their efforts were thwarted, and in February 1644, 150 heavily armed Dutch killed 700 Indian warriors near Stamford, Connecticut. Opesh Kennet was imprisoned in Virginia for two years, during which time he suffered various insults from the British colonists. On April 18, 1646, an Indian warden, enraged by the British insult to Opus Gaynor, hacked him to death with an axe. Opus Gaynor's death marked the decline of the Powhatan League and the entrenchment of British rule in Virginia at the same time. It is worth noting that in the above-mentioned conflicts between the British colonists and the Indians, the participants were the militias of the British colonists, not the regular army. Since then, it has become a tradition for colonists to take up arms to defend their homeland. Men and women, young and old, are trained to use weapons from an early age, a tradition that has been preserved to this day. There was also a legal reason for the conflict between the colonizers and the indigenous peoples, namely the loopholes in the concessions issued by the British. Although the boundaries and extent of the colonies were clearly stated in all the concessions, this was done well along the coast. But the inland extension is quite obscure. Thus, this led to a problem. Territorial disputes and even conflicts between two neighboring colonies often occurred in the interior. The same is true of the treatment of Indian territories. Some reap the benefits by manipulating parliament to control the colonial government. Smallholder farmers gradually migrated to the Appalachian Mountains and beyond to gain access to land. Due to the distance, there is often no representation in Parliament to help them fight for their interests. In Virginia's Upper James River, disgruntled smallholders chose an unexpected leader, Nathaniel Bacon, a wealthy British-born plantation owner. Although Bacon came to the Virginia colony in 1674 to develop his career and influence, he soon fell into conflict with Governor William Barclay, although he became a member of the Governor's Advisory Council for a time. At first, they seemed to work closely together, but as time went on, their differences over the handling of land and Indian issues became apparent. The Governor of Barclay tended to adopt a moderate and conservative strategy, trying to maintain peaceful trade relations with the Indians in order to avoid unnecessary conflict. However, this policy of his was strongly opposed by Bacon, Bacon believed that the Indians were a threat and should be driven out or even exterminated. He expressed dissatisfaction with the governor's decree, arguing that it limited the colonists' freedom to expand and hindered their right to pursue more land and wealth. Bacon was convinced of his right to buy or occupy land on Indian territory and was willing to use force to protect his interests. At the same time, he accused the governor of being too lenient with the Indians and failing to provide adequate protection to the British who were under attack. This series of contradictions quickly led Bacon to become the leader of the group of Englishmen who were dissatisfied with the policies of the governor, threatened by the Indians, or struggled on the margins of society. These include poor farmers, artisans, and traders, as well as former slaves and women who seek more opportunity and respect. 
At the same time, Bacon was joined by wealthy and influential plantation owners or politicians with their own agendas, either to challenge the authority of the governor or to use Bacon for their own political goals. Thus, between March 1676 and January 1677, Bacon led a massive rebellion, the Bacon Revolt. The insurgents included thousands of supporters, among whom were not only the British, but also Indians who joined their cause. The uprising went through several stages, at first it seemed unstoppable, but due to various internal and external factors, it eventually failed to fully achieve its desired goals. Phase 1, Bacon's attack on the Indians. Without the permission of the governor, Bacon led an army of about 600 soldiers to attack a number of Indian tribes friendly with the British, such as the Doug, Okanichi, and Susquehannock. He killed many Indians, robbed them of their belongings, and burned down their villages. He claimed to be avenging the British who had been victimized by the Indians, but in reality he was seeking his own interests and fame. However, when Bacon prepared to expand further, he found that not all British colonists supported his actions, which led him to reconsider his strategy. In addition, Bacon's brutality caused hostility among some otherwise neutral Indian tribes, further complicating the situation. Phase 2 – Confrontation between Bacon and the Doge Governor Barclay was furious at Bacon's actions, believing that Bacon was provoking unnecessary war, destroying peaceful relations with the Indians, and violating his statutes and orders. He ordered Bacon's arrest and declared him a traitor. Bacon refused to comply and returned to Jamestown with his troops, asking the governor to issue him a legitimate warrant of appointment as a full military commander and to recognize the justice of his war against the Indians. However, in the midst of this power struggle, Bacon unexpectedly acquired a number of recruits who came to take refuge, which strengthened his ability to stand up to the governor. Nevertheless, after several skirmishes with the Doge's army, Bacon realized that it was difficult to achieve his goals by force alone and began to seek other allies. Stage 3 – Bacon's Attack on Jamestown Although Bacon was approved by the governor, he did not stop his rebellion. He continued to attack the Indians and also tried to expand his sphere of influence and recruit more supporters. He also began to threaten or take revenge on the British who did not support him or oppose him, such as confiscating their property arresting or executing them, and so on. However, in the process, Bacon encountered a lot of criticism and opposition from other colonial leaders, who feared that Bacon's actions would destabilize the entire colony. At the same time, Bacon also found himself unable to control all his subordinates, and some of his subordinates began to resent his extreme behavior. Stage 4 at the end of Bacon's revolt. Bacon did not receive more support or victory after burning Jamestown. On the contrary, he was resisted and resisted by many British and Indians. And due to the long hours of fighting and the hardships of life, he also began to have problems with his body. On October 26, 1676, Bacon suddenly developed a high fever and died shortly thereafter. His death was a fatal blow to the Bacon Revolt, for without his leadership and inspiration, his forces soon collapsed and scattered. But before that, Bacon had tried to negotiate a settlement with the Doge in the hope of preserving his position and results. However, these attempts ultimately failed, as Governor Barclay took the opportunity to restore control of the colony and imposed severe penalties on those involved in the rebellion, including confiscation of property, deprivation of rights, and even execution. In this way, the Bacon Revolt was declared over. As for the results of Bacon's uprising, we can say this, Bacon, although he was heroic in battle, but in the end he died heroically, and his dreams and ideals were not realized, which was his first setback. However, his actions caused a certain resonance among the colonizers, although this resonance did not translate into enough support to change the situation. For the governor, he quelled the rebellion, but the rebellion damaged his image in the hearts of the people, and with it, Trust and support were lost, which was the first challenge he faced. However, the governor maintained order through harsh means, which consolidated his authority to a certain extent. For the British, they ensured that their rule in the Virginia colony was not threatened, but at the cost of huge sacrifices and losses. Nonetheless, the conflict also exposed the weaknesses of colonial policy, forcing Britain to reconsider its approach to the New World. As for the Indians, although they got rid of the threat of Bacon, this did not bring the desired peace and respect. 
However, the revolt also made the Indians realize the need for more stable relations with the British. Overall, the Peconic Revolt was a war from which neither side benefited. As for the spread of faith, believers are usually eager to spread their faith more widely and they are both believers and communicators. This was especially true of Christians, but there was a general lack of enthusiasm among the Puritans of the North American colonial period for spreading Christianity to the Indians. There were certainly exceptions to this attitude, but it was also the underlying factor in the spread of faith that triggered a new round of conflict between the colonists and the Indians. John Eliot is one of those exceptions. He was a devout and diligent Puritan missionary who cared not only for his own parishioners, but also for the Indians around him. However, spreading Christianity to the Indians was not an easy task, and the biggest obstacle Eliot faced was language differences. Although communicating through translation was not effective and could easily cause misunderstanding or confusion, Eliot did not give up. He realized that in order to effectively spread the Christian faith, it was necessary to learn a Levin Indian language. So, in 1643, Eliot began a difficult journey of language 11. Through tireless efforts, he mastered this complex and beautiful language and used it to write teaching materials for his mission. Despite this, there was a risk of misunderstanding and opposition in the process of spreading Christianity, but Eliot stuck to his mission, which became an important period in his career. In 1646, when Eliot was finally ready to preach to the Indians, he chose a place called Noondong to carry out his mission. The Massachusetts Indians who lived there were friendly to the British and had a certain interest in Christianity, which was his first step. However, when Eliot walked into the village with his readings and Bible verses written in the Indian language, the first problem he faced was the suspicion of the Indians. But when he began to introduce himself in their language, the Indians were surprised to find that the Englishman could not only speak their language, but also write their language, so that the Indians treated him with respect and curiosity and agreed to listen to him. Eliot began his first sermon, expounding on the core concepts of Christianity in simple and vivid Indian language. His skillful use of metaphors and examples familiar to the Indians to explain complex concepts attracted the attention of the Indians, and was the basis for the success of the sermon. However, after the sermon lasted more than two hours, the Indians asked many questions and doubts about these novel concepts, and Eliot needed to answer them patiently. He guided thinking and communication through questions and answers, and invited the Indians to participate in the next gathering. As time passed, Eliot preaching to the Indians became more and more successful, and more and more Indians began to embrace the Christian faith. Sesamorn was one of them, who not only converted to the original religion, but also became a student and assistant to Eliot. Because Sesamorn learned English and Christian etiquette and helped with translation work. But Sesamorn had mixed and contradictory feelings, on the one hand, he longed to assimilate into British society and culture, and on the other hand, he wanted to preserve his Indian identity and traditions. At the same time, he wanted both the trust of Eliot and the friendship with King Philip, the hostile chief of the Powhatan League, who had been Sesamon's employer and ally King Philip was deeply dissatisfied with the British invasion of territory, the deprivation of resources, the spread of disease, and attempts to change local beliefs and lifestyles, and this resentment could lead to new conflicts. Between 1646 and 1675, Sesamon was on both sides, spreading Christianity for Eliot and providing intelligence and advice to King Philip, which made his position delicate. He was even involved in some plots to assassinate or kidnap British or Indians, showing that his double life was fraught with danger and uncertainty. But when he tries to balance these two identities, a problem arises. His deception begins to arouse suspicion among those around him. Eventually, he fails to manage his dual role and is ruined by his own deception and betrayal. In January 1675, Sesamon abruptly changed his position. He informed Josiah Winslow, the governor of the Plymouth colony, that King Philip was plotting a massive attack on the British. His motives may have been to protect his family and property, or to be rewarded and praised by the British, or to take revenge for King Philip's distrust and neglect. However, after this decision, his whistleblowing did not bring him the expected safety and honor. Sesamon's whistleblowing did not bring him any good, but rather brought him disaster. King Philip soon discovered his betrayal and sent someone to assassinate him. In February 1675, 
Sesamon's body was found in a frozen pond with his neck strangled and his head smashed into the ice. The British were very outraged by his death, considered it a provocation to them, and responded. They sent a jury of colonists and Indian elders to try three Powhatan Indians accused of being the killers of the Sesamor. The three Indians were found guilty and hanged. This operation can be said to have become the beginning of the war, as it completely angered King Philip and the other Indians. King Philip, whose original name was Metico, was an influential Indian chief in the Powhatan League. He and his family members took the English name and tried to maintain friendly relations and trade with the British, as it represented an attempt to adapt to a foreign culture. However, over time, they came to realize that by taking English names, they could inadvertently lose their national identity and dignity. King Philip was born around 1620, just as the British had just arrived on the North American continent to establish the colony of Plymouth. His father, Powhatan, was a wise and peace-hungry chieftain who signed a peace treaty with the British, ensuring friendly cooperation between the two sides. However, despite Powhatan's efforts to keep the peace, he saw the British thirst for resources grow gradually. Powhatan helped the British survive a difficult winter, teaching them crops such as corn and pumpkins, and his kindness was not entirely exchanged for lasting harmony. He even married his daughter Pocahontas to an Englishman, John Rolfe, and this interracial marriage became a landmark event in the history of the North American colonies. Growing up in such a harmonious and affluent environment, King Philip was influenced by the British education while maintaining his own Indian traditions and beliefs. He became a wise and courageous young chieftain and was deeply respected and loved by his own tribe and other Indian tribes. However, as outside influences deepened, King Philip began to recognize the complexity of his relationship with the British. He became acquainted with a number of Englishmen, including the missionaries John Elliot and Sesamon, a Harvard graduate, prayer Indian who would later become his secretary and advisor. However, these relations were not always uneventful especially when King Philip began to perceive the expansionist intentions of the British. As time went on, King Philip found himself and his tribe in an increasingly difficult situation. The British were growing more and more, constantly encroaching on the lands and resources of the Indians, and spreading diseases. It was during this period that King Philip began to question his father and brother's previous decision to maintain friendly relations with the British. The laws and treaties made by the British restricted the rights of the Indians and even committed violence against the Indians. These inspired King Philip's determination to resist. He began to have deep doubts about the intentions of the British and decided to take action. In 1662, after the death of King Philip's brother Alexander II at the interrogation of the British, King Philip succeeded to the position of chieftain as the leader of the Powhatan League. He decided to change tactics and no longer seek compromise or cooperation with the British. He began to secretly unite other Indian tribes, preparing against the British. He gathered weapons, trained soldiers, and strategized to restore the sovereignty and dignity of the Indians on the North American continent. In January 1675, King Philip's plans were unfortunately leaked. Sesamon, who had been a loyal former secretary, betrayed him and informed Josiah Winslow the governor of the Plymouth colony, claiming that King Philip was plotting a massive attack on the British. However, this whistleblower was not without controversy, as some believe that Seaman may have acted out of personal vendettas. Despite this, Sesamon's actions led directly to a brutal war, the King Philip War, which lasted 14 months and resulted in thousands of deaths, making it one of the bloodiest conflicts in the history of the North American colonies. However, the war also sparked more discussions about Indian rights, although these discussions did not translate into actual change at the time. King Philip did not abandon his plan when he learned that he had been informed. Instead, he decided to move ahead and launched an attack on the 24th of June, 1675, leading thousands of Indian soldiers to attack the English community in Swansea. It was the first official exchange of fire in King Philip's wars, and he not only killed many Englishmen, but also robbed them of their belongings and burned houses and churches. Although he claimed to be avenging the Indians who had been abused or killed by the British, he actually had another purpose, to fight for freedom and justice for himself and his people. The attack was not supported by all the Indians, and some tribes had reservations about waging war. 
After King Philip attacked Swansea, he did not stop his military campaign. He continued to expand the scope of the war, constantly sending squads or individuals to raid other British communities, such as Providence, Massachusetts Bay, Connecticut Valley, and other places. At the same time, he united other Indian tribes such as the Narragansett, Nipmuc, Potoket, etc., to form a powerful alliance. Together, they confronted the aggression and oppression of the British, demonstrating the unity and courage of the Indians. However, as the war dragged on and the British retaliatory attacks intensified, some Indian tribes began to tire themselves on protracted warfare. King Philip, although he had some victories in the early stages of the war, then suffered a serious blow. His tribe was destroyed by the British, soldiers were killed or captured, and his family was even sold into slavery. To make matters worse, he lost some of his Indian allies who had supported him. Some tribes defected because they could not withstand the pressure or temptation of the British, and some left because they were dissatisfied or disappointed with the way King Philip had led. King Philip can only evade pursuit in the forests and swamps with a few loyal followers, constantly searching for new hiding places or allies. However, even in such desperate circumstances, King Philip's spirit of resistance inspired later Indians to continue their struggle. On August 12, 1676, King Philip's last hideout was discovered by the British, but the discovery was not without warning. Originally, a British soldier named John Alden had obtained information through bribery, but he did not know that the source of the news was King Philip's brother Lord Orman, a chief of the Powhatan League who had a dispute with King Philip. However, Old Ormond's betrayal was not motivated by pure resentment, he was also attracted by the promises of the British. He took LinkedIn people to Mount Hope, where King Philip's ancestors lived and his last refuge. The British surrounded the place and opened fire, but just as they were about to arrest King Philip, Old Ormond unexpectedly shot King Philip in the heart, ending his life instantly. After the death of King Philip, the British insulted and mutilated him, scalped him off, and cut off his head and hands. However, before splitting his body into four pieces and hanging it on a tree, they accidentally discovered an amulet on King Philip's body, supposedly to protect him from his enemies. Still, they brought his head back to Boston, where it was displayed as a trophy on the city gates. In this way, although the King Philip War came to an end, it left a profound aftermath and lesson. This is how King Philip launched an early attack in January 1675 after his plans were met, expanding the scope of the war. Despite the heavy blows, he did not give up immediately. However, after a series of battles, King Philip eventually died. The war was a disaster and a tragedy for both the Indians and the British. Let's take a look at some of the shifts and consequences of this war. For the Indians, they lost a lot of people and land in this war. It is estimated that about 3,000 Indians died in the war, or 40% of the total number of Indians in New England at the time. However, even in the face of such losses, some tribes were united by the war and formed new alliances. About 1,000 Indians were captured or enslaved by the British, and some of them were sent to the Caribbean or elsewhere to do hard labor. In addition, about 2,000 Indians died as a result of famine, disease, or displacement. Many of the Indians' villages and crops were also burned or looted by the British. Nevertheless, some survivors managed to preserve their culture and identity after the end of the war and continued to fight for their rights. The dominance and influence of the Indians on the North American continent was weakened or eliminated by the British, who had to accept British rule and laws, renounce their faith and culture, or migrate further afield. For the British, although they won this war, they also paid a heavy price. It is estimated that about 600 Britons died in the war, or 5% of the total number of Britons in New England at the time. However, this figure does not fully reflect the destructive effect of war on the social fabric. About 1,200 Britons were injured or disabled. About 1,200 British houses were burned or damaged by the Indians, but at the same time prompted improvements in building techniques and urban planning in colonial society. About 8,000 livestock were killed or stolen by the Indians, which dealt a heavy blow to the agricultural economy. The British economy and society were also severely hit and disrupted, and they had to spend a lot of money and supplies to sustain the war and rebuild their homes. They also faced food shortages, 
disease epidemics, and psychological trauma, which became more prominent in the post-war recovery process. For Elliot, he lost many friends and followers in this war. He used to spread Christianity to the Indians in the Indian language and wrote an Indian Bible. He wanted to make the Indians followers of Christ and live in peace with the British. But in this war, he saw the Indians and the British, whom he loved, killing and hating each other. He saw that the Indian Bible he had written was used as a torch or a bullet. However, after the war ended, Elliot did not abandon his mission and continued to work to repair relations with the Indians and help them get back to life. He saw the town of prayer he had found that destroyed or abandoned, but he remained faithful that understanding and reconciliation between cultures could be achieved through education and religion. He felt great sadness and disappointment, but at the same time he held on to hope that the future would lead to a better way to get along. After King Philip's death, the fighting did not end immediately, and some men continued to resist in New Hampshire and Maine until 1678. The brutality of the war was beyond imagination, and the casualties on both sides were very heavy. No family in New England was completely out of the way, and each family was drawn into the war in a different way. The war caused unprecedented casualties in the history of the United States in terms of proportion to the total population. However, unexpectedly, aid from the UK did not arrive as expected. In addition, in the performance of the local militia, they proved themselves to be a formidable fighting force, far superior to their British counterparts. Without these militias, the Indians might not have been cornered. The brutality of war is painful for all. When King Philip was finally killed, his head was cut off and sent to Boston for public display, while his hands were sent to Plymouth, acts that were considered at the time the ultimate humiliation of his authority. However, after the end of the war, many of the survivors were burdened with psychological scars that would be difficult to erase. The war also had a profound impact on the Puritan pastors, who saw the disaster as a manifestation of God's displeasure with New England. It was, as they wrote, such a terrible trial, a test of their faith and way of life. Well, that's all for today's lesson on the conflict between the North American colonists and the Indians. In the next video on American history, we'll continue to explore other historical events, so thank you for watching.